Virginia Tech, and he will be telling us about his work on supersymmetry on curved spaces. Uh, and he's here just for uh, the day, so if you have you know, questions and concerns, make sure to grab them. Uh, and we'll organize some dinner for tonight as well. So, bye. Please, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Larry. And thank you uh, for coming, and uh, it's a pleasure to give a talk here. And uh, this talk will be based on two papers I wrote with, with my PhD advisor, Eric Sharp and Virginia Tech. So, naturally, this talk has two parts. Part one is uh, about a four-dimensional super symmetric series on general four manifold. And part two is about a particular space in two dimensions, the two sphere, which we all know. And uh, I'm going to talk about 2,2 two two nonlinear sigma models on two sphere. So as a, as a general motivation of all this line of works, uh, silver symmetry has been, has been around for some 40 years. And people have been studying a lot of it, but mostly people have been focusing on uh, the Minkowski space, space time super symmetry case because that's what people, par particle physics do. Try to, try to apply super symmetry to particle phenomenology or model building. You, you, you gotta use Minkowski space time. But from a theory point of view, this is really not the general space time that can use. So, incidentally, uh, over the last uh, several years, uh, there have been many new dis uh, developments on uh, super symmetric quantum field theories on curved space times in various dimensions. As it started back in 2011, we did paper from Adams, Jokers, Kumar, Lapin. And they actually constructed a single nonlinear sigma model on ADS4 space. And ADS4 gets used a lot in, in string theory because of ADS CFT constru uh, construction. And later, uh, like a month later, uh, Fastesh and Saber uh, wrote their paper, which include a general procedure of constructing a lot of super symmetric quantum field theory on curved four manifolds. And uh, the idea was to start actually with super gravity. And then you somehow free super gravity uh, degree of freedom, and you're left with a rigidly supersymmetric background, and you can do your quantum field theory on, on top of that curved background. And later, a lot of work has been done following this uh, line of reasoning, and there are many papers, I'm only listing uh, some of them that's relevant to my discussion today. So. Uh, uh, on one hand, this, all these new developments are uh, new uh, quantum field series on curved space time with supersymmetry, of course. But they are basically quantum field series on curved space time. So they have very peculiar properties that are different from the usual quantum field theory properties that we know. And they also provide uh, many tools for further discussion, even quantum field series on flat space time, or even string theory. And uh, there are a lot of te techniques that been followed along this line, such as supersymmetric localization technique, that allows you to compute a lot of the useful stuff exactly quantum mechanically, exactly uh, 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 physical quantity that won't be able to, people won't be able to compute for. So let me start with part one: supersymmetric gauge series on four manifolds. So as I mentioned earlier, for session cyber in their paper 2011 proposed a general procedure of constructing rigidly supersymmetric series on four uh, manifolds. The idea was to start with the, uh, their particular paper discussed um, old minimal supergravity, the gravity, supergravity you can find in Weiss and Becker, and they found a way of decoupling from gravity. And uh, I must mention that a similar procedure was proposed earlier using onshell supergravity by uh, another group of people. And their idea was to uh, uh, freeze gravity degree of freedom, then the auxiliary fields in that in that super gravity multiplied will have to satisfy a bunch of equations that we'll see later. And these solutions to these equations will determine your four-dimensional space-time geometry. And uh, um, uh, what's more is that uh, the super gravity transformation of the gravitinos, and you set gravitino to zero, this Sutti transformation of gravitino will give you the Killing spinners um, space-time that you need to close your Sutti algebra because we know on um, current space-time there is generically no such thing as constant or covariant constant Killing spinner. So you got a covariant constant spinner, so you're gonna to have to have a Killing spinner equation which has solutions. So this general Was the 4D done uh, for new minimal or shell? Yeah, it is done for minimal minimal by, by other people, yes. By other people. Yes. Okay. And also people have tried some other weird supergravity too. Nice. Yeah. 
But all this n equals one is equivalent. Oh, actually, n equals two was down to, to my knowledge. Okay. And as a side to your question, n equals two uh, supersymmetry on fourth gear was developed, and uh, people used it to compute Cartesian function of mm -hmm. n equals two star on fourth gear, and they uh, they would be able to relate the computation to instant counting, for example, and some other mathematical. If you go beyond n equals two, you will face the issue of uh, not having off shell yeah. theory available. Exactly. And life gets harder, right? Exactly. exactly. Okay. So uh, let me start with a brief review of this general procedure of precision cyber. Uh, so I'm going to stick with n equals one four dimensional old minimal supergravity uh, that Weston Berger. So here's a Lagrangian that, that I, you can find in Weston Berger of uh, that supergravity coupled to carrier multiplex. And here, uh, capital K is the killer potential on your target space or the modular space of your zero gravity theory, and W is the uh, zero potential, a generic holomorphic quantity that you can put on your target space. And this is a super space Lagrangian. A kappa square is basically the gravitational coupling constant, and it's inverse to the uh, Planck constant in four dimensions. And uh, the idea is to actually treat kappa square as a parameter, and you expand your Lagrangian in terms of this parameter, and you throw away all the terms that, you de that are de depending on this uh, kappa square, and only keeps this one single term that is independent from this kappa square, which basically is the same as if, if you take the uh, Planck mass to infinity, which means your curved background is kind of fixed, and your gravitational coupling is kind of fixed, so you have a fixed non-trivial background, and your quantum field theory lives on this fixed background. So that's the resulting Lagrangian, and of course, all these superfused uh, components will be uh, 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 changed accordingly to your decoupling procedure. So this is, this is step one. You expand your Lagrangian and pick the term that has no gravitational coupling. And then what we want is we want rigidly n equals 1 supersymmetry in four dimensions, and we want killer invariance because we know n equals 1 uh, supersymmetry demand killer invariance. So accordingly, uh, by decoupling gravity, I'm setting gravity you know, to zero, so the gravitation, uh, the super gravity transmission of the gravitinos will give you a bunch of equations. So these are the equations that you can get from setting gravity you know, to zero. And here M and M bar and B mu are auxiliary fields in the super gravity multiples. So you've got a bunch of equations. And uh, what these guys did is they actually solved these equations and they proposed a bunch of solutions to those equations in terms of another bunch of equations. So the solution to uh, these two equations are given by these equations involving only the auxiliary fields M and bar B mu inside the gravity multiplet and also some quantity on your space time, for example, Riemann tensor on your space time and also here W is the uh, wild tensor on your space time. And of course G mu nu is, your, uh, is the curvature tensor on your space time. So these are some equations limiting your choice of the algorithm fields and also your geometry <laughs> of, of, of your space time. And quite naturally, the solutions of these equations will give you a particular background uh, space time geometry. So this gentleman proposed two classes of solutions. So the first class of solution are given by m and the bar being constant, and b is just a zero everywhere. And another class of solution are given by uh, m and bar being zero everywhere, and b here is a covariantly constant vector. So apparently, these solutions will impose constraints on your space-time geometry because of this equation right here. So that we will see that these two classes of uh, solutions of the auxiliary fields will will give us two different classes of space time. That's, that's the Ricci tensor, right? That you yeah, it's the Ricci tensor. I'm sorry, yeah, you're right. Yeah, okay. Definitely. Well, can't you have both at the same time? I mean, they're matching, or why do you set one of them equal to zero? Yeah, yeah. M and bar are complex conjugates. No, 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 no. Why do you set B is equal to zero and keep M, or you set M is equal to zero? Like B not equal to zero, not equal no, that's that's the equation there, and B product oh, to zero. Okay. That, that's not possible. Yeah, that's what's going on. It's an overstand uh, solution of killing spin equation, so the equation motion from the Lagrangian. 
This is, actually, this is not an equation of motion. It's that's the yeah. only thing yeah. I did. This is from yeah, a solution of killing spinner equation. That is the solution of a killing spinner equation. Yeah, uh, this, 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 is not a genetic, this is not a standard killing spinner equation. If you think about the uh, killing spinner equation in the mathematical sense, here I don't have just a single Dirac operator. I have something like this, a uh, very yeah. complex operator. Moreover, this is off shell. It means that you don't need field equations. Exactly. So this makes sense. So part of this framework, we need a solution of the theory, not just a solution of killing. Well, this is step two. We are not, right? We are not yeah. discussing. There's no model. This is what I'm going to ask. Well, uh, well your model. Yeah. So far, I, I'm only decoupling gravity. Nothing about equation motion is in the so I don't yeah. use the equation measure at all from zero gravity. It is a standard taking spinner equation, isn't it? And no, you can no. see it acts all linear, linearly on the spinner, so you can yes, yes, put but everything into the connection. But here, connection. Two, two different things. Here, first, for, first uh, in Kelly spinner, you don't have a vector field inside your Kelly spinner. Typically, if, that's a, if there's a vector field or some other tensor field inside your Kinney spin equation, it's not called Kinney spin equation. But it's a twister, you can add mathematically. It. Well, what's in the name? Where did this come from? This, these are from their paper, the uh, paper. Well, yeah, okay, but, uh, oh, these are the super gravity transformation of the graph, you know. You can find it in uh, the math. But isn't that more or less what one means by Kinney spin? Yeah, yeah, in a sense, yes, but mathematically, this yeah, is, okay. is not Kinney's spin equation. Just a humble question. Let sure. be the incoherent constant situation. Uh -huh. Does it mean that if I uh, go to the tangent frame, the components of B mu, uh -huh. uh, will they be constant? Yes. They yes. the constant. Exactly. That's what you mean. Exactly. So your connection is the canonical uh, connection, not bosonic torsion. No, no, no. It's just everything is remaining. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, corresponding to the two classes of solution I, I was just talking about, you find two classes of Killing spinner. Now we have a standard Killing spinner equation. You have Dirac operator, then you have some constant times your spinner. So. This corresponds to the first class solution, B is zero and M is not zero. And uh, another weird looking generalized Killing spinner equation is given by the second class of, uh, uh, solution to the auxiliary fields because now you have a vector field inside your equation. And the solution to these two equations will give you the space time geometry I will talk right now. So, uh, first of all, the first equation, if you look at it, uh, it's a uh, it's a traditional Kelly spin equation, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, sure. is that a typo in the second one? You've yeah. got zeta sitting to the left, the gamma. Is that what you intend? Oh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, you're actually right. Yeah, zeta should be here. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah you're right. Thank you. Shouldn't be that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, if you take the first class of solution, and now, so we have first Kenyan spinner equation, which is the standard one. Uh, you can you we will you can derive that your space-time geometry, your space-time metric will have to be either is ha it has a constant sectional curvature, or it has is a, it is Ricci flat and has self-dual and self-dual curvature tensor. So that's the two cases you can derive from this single Kenyan spinner equation. So. A uh, brief way of saying this is that if you write down the Killing spin equation in both of the data and data bar, and you take the commutator of the two equations on both sides, commutator of a covariant derivative gives you a Riemann curvature tensor, and commutator on the, on the other hand gives you some other constraint, and use a bunch of identities of uh, sigma matrices or gamma matrices, you can derive these two conditions. And similarly, if you start with the second a uh, weird looking Killing spinner equation, you can do a similar thing. You take a combinator, you, you do a bit of algebra, you see that uh, to, to have a solution to the second class of Killing spinner equation, your space time uh, uh, metric will have to be a product of a line and some other three dimensional space, and three dimensional space will also have to have a non negative constant sectional curvature, which basically says that your, your space time has to be a space form. Constant section of curvature by definition means your remaining manifold has it is called what's called a space form. Yes. So what is epsilon in the first equation? Epsilon, yeah, I believe it's a typo too. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <be there>. Yeah. 
good. I'm so sorry. Second question is uh, in the second case yes. where uh, you have the B field, unconventional yes. killing spin equation. Uh, is it uh, really the case that the most general solution to it is a product space, product yes. of the three manifolds yes. with, with, with the real line? With the real line, that's, that's or, it. Or uh, not a circle? No, just a line. Just a line. Just a line. And the 3D space is a... Because a space for example, space three sphere. Three sphere, or it could be squashed three sure, sphere? Sure, of course, yes. Yeah. Anything nice. with a constant section of curvature will be fine. I see. Yeah. Sorry, how do you yes. distinguish between the line and the circle? I mean, are these local uh, actually, the, this, the solution to this equation will depend on uh, we will, we will, we uh, determine topology, not local, uh, local behavior. But it, it, this is actually a mathematical thing. So you have some sort of differential equation you want to solve. And basically, you, you find a geometric way of interpreting your, your uh, uh, differential equation. Basically, typically, the case is going to be that the, the solution, the existence of the solution will impose a top, topological constraint on your solution set. So that's the case here. It's an actually, actually a topological thing, not a... Sorry, uh, how many solutions did we, did we find? Oh, I only... Anything fits into this description we find. I, I only discussed a couple of examples. No, what possible. I mean is the number of supersymmetry parameters. Oh, A equals 1, so 4, uh, four, four supercharges. Um, it starts from 4. No, I'm, I'm asking about the number of solutions. Oh, the number of solutions? To the given killing spinner equation. Let's go back to those equations, sure. in particular in the second case. Okay. I mean, if I solve this equation, I find one spinner. Uh -huh. But the amount of supersymmetry, uh, I guess since we are in four dimensions, yes. that's all we can have, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, Just, that, that's the only parameter inside the Suzy transformation, so Suzy algebra. How does the counting go? You are not breaking any one by finding only one solution no, to this equation? Just, just keep is that maximal Suzy? You, you no, I'm start. I started with n plus one, so I'm not breaking any supersymmetry. So I'm still with. I still have n plus one in four dimensions. I'm not convinced because uh, if you if I give you a squash three sphere times uh, R one, okay, surely it should have less supersymmetry. <coughs> well, maybe uh, round sphere times this one or Minkowski four. Okay. Uh, intuitively, I expected less uh, solution, less supersymmetry. Don't, don't, don't you? Why, why not? I, I, don't, I don't. Experience oh. with killing okay. spinner equations. Okay. The, uh, yeah, solutions you, don't you find grow in trees, you know? Okay. Um, I, yeah. Sorry? Well, if you find one solution, then it just gives you one charge. And four. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. If you find one solution, then it just gives you one charge and not four. Not four. So there's one quarter, so they understand. What? You see my counting? It's one quarter to this. This, this, this is a, how should I say, uh, in your super symmetry yes. transformation you have a zeta parameter, which is a spinner has four components, and this is that zeta. Yeah, well, I need an extra label, which will tell me how many of them. So you're, you're looking for the spinner label? Yes. And then yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping them, oh. I'm not showing the spinner label. No, this in is addition a to the spinner label, I need a label that will count number of solutions, number of spinners. Okay. That's how I count supersymmetry. Okay. Chris, would you agree with that? Uh, no. Yeah, but maybe it's different. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So these are two uh, generic classes of geometry that we can get in four dimensions following the generic procedure of fast and cyber. And, uh, Okay, so if you take the first class solution and you, you plug in the auxiliary field in your Lagrangian, this is the Lagrangian you get in super space. And the one particular thing we should observe is that you have a weird combination of killer potential and super potential. And this is very peculiar to this kind of geometry because uh, this is actually a killer transformation if you really think about it. W is holomorphic, W bar is any homomorphic, so this is actually a killer transformation. And this, this quantity, this combination between K and W is the only thing that's physically meaningful. So if you want a, 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 a theory that is well defined over this <coughs> curve for manifolds, uh, you're going to have to allow uh, some sort of killer transformation. And because I have this combination between K and W, a killer transformation on K should be compensated by uh, some sort of transformation of the super potential. And this is very uh, suggesting 
that uh, your supervisor is actually not a potential per se, it's not a holomorphic function because it actually transforms if you go over coordinate patches. So uh, this phenomenon was observed by, the, uh, by these authors in their ADS4 discussion, also later by other groups of people. So, of course, coordinate patches on your target space are the modular space of original supergravity you started with. You have a non trivial generically, you, have a non, you can do non trivial kind of trader transformation, which means your supervisor has to transform accordingly. And that is saying that your supervisor is a section of something. And this something is actually what a mathematician called Ifan bundle. It's, a, it's like a vector bundle, except the fibers are not vector space. The fibers are affine spaces modeled over some vector space. So W uh, here is not just a function anymore. It's, it's a section of this rank one iPhone bundle. And this uh, O part is a trivial log bundle, which means that you do not have any like phase rotation of W, but you do have a translation. And that translation is handled by this torsor part uh, of the iPhone bundle. And this is very uh, uh, similar to the becker witten log bundle story in supergravity. Back in the early 80s, uh, Becker and Witten discovered that the uh, superpotential of n equals 1 over the major of supergravity is not a holomorphic function. It's a section of the log bundle called the Becker Witten log bundle. Here, we don't have a log bundle because the log bundle part is actually trivial, but the torso part is actually non trivial. So, this is very, related, it's very much related, related to uh, the Becker Witten story. And we will see a later consequence of this phenomenon in gauge theory. So as a side of uh, there, I, I'm showing you some defini definitions of iPhone space and iPhone bundle. So basically, iPhone space is a vector space without origin. You're allowed to do translations any way you want. And uh, iPhone space is as some linear structure, so you can have morphism between iPhone spaces just like you have morphism between like, vector space. So these are just some average definitions. And uh, of course, with uh, iPhone space structure and uh, morphism between iPhone space, you're allowed to define a bundle using these guys as fibers, just like the vector bundle de 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 definition. It's just that instead of vector bundle, vector space homomorphisms, <coughs> now you have uh, this iPhone space morphisms between different fibers. So let's uh, talk more about this combination between Keller potential and super potential. Physically, this is actually suggesting that neither K nor W is meaningful physically. It's only this combination that enters the physics. So, of course, you can do any Kähler transformation, or you can do any iPhone bundle transformation that transform, transform your, your W or K that you start with. So, a single K or a single W is not meaningful physically. And this combination is actually what's meaningful, and we will actually use this phenomenon later in the construction of gauge theory. And mathematically, this is actually a very well-defined quantity globally on your uh, target space. Because target space, you have a non-trivial geometry, and these guys are sections of some, some bundles. So this, this, this combination can be interpreted mathematically as a, as a pairing between a bundle and its dual bundle. So this is a very uh, natural consistency, mathematical consistency requirement. You can, you can see that, that it's satisfied. So one of the consequences of this uh, iPhone bundle thing is that uh, if you s look at the transformation across patches, alpha, alpha, beta, these transition functions, uh, by definition, they will have to satisfy this consistency on triple, or triple overlap, which is saying that they are check cycles. And by, the, by construction, they are check boundaries. So your killer transmission, uh, your killer form over uh, is, is uh, allowed to transform using this uh, alpha alpha beta is saying that your killer form itself is actually cohomogeneously trivial on your entire target, target space. So this is a very strong constraint on your target space geometry too. We don't, we don't just see that we have constraint on, on your space-time geometry, we also, also see a consequence of a constraint on your target space. Yeah. Excuse me, do, do these statements get to the to the super space? I mean, are you talking no, about this is, about this, is component, this is not super space anymore. This is just uh, component field. Uh, okay, so uh, because the, your killer form is actually cohomogeneous trivial, you're allowed to, to define a globally well-defined killer potential on your entire 
uh, target space, not just a local function, it's uh, global. You can find a globally what you find a real function that is called k potential. And in most of the cases, you, you, you're going to study uh, this constraint also means your target, target space is actually not compact. It's another topological constraint you can derive from some equation. So uh, this phenomenon was observed by the uh, first paper, uh, several first papers in this uh, field. So uh, another consequence was, pro uh, was actually proposed by Adam Jokers, Kuma, and Lapan in their paper. And they only talked about ADS4 in their paper. So they started with ADS4 case. It's called a background principle. The statement is that if you have an equals one uh, theory or uh, in Minkowski time, space time that you couple to zero gravity. And if, if this uh, coupling is quantum mechanically anomaly free, which means your zero gravity anomaly vanishes, then you can continuously or smoothly deform your theory to ADS4 by adding curvature dependent terms, by demanding killer, uh, uh, killing uh, spinners and such, and vice versa. Suppose you have a theory that it can be smoothly deformed to uh, 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 ADS4, then this theory on the cause design you start with can be uh, consistently coupled to super gravity with no anomaly. So this is actually a classical and quantum correspondence. You have some classical consistency that you want to define a theory classically. It's equivalent to a anomaly free condition in super gravity. So this is a very non trivial statement. And uh, one, one can immediately observe that this principle actually holds for all the geometries in the first class of solutions that we have seen earlier. Does this mean that really uh, the, the, the quantum uh, anomaly freedom in super gravity? Theory yes. is a necessary condition for it to give to have a Minkowski limit. Is that the no? It's it's, yeah. it's the uh, anomaly free condition in super gravity is uh, if and only if, if condition to deform this original theory, flat space time theory, to some curved manifold. But if I go the other way, if I give you super gravity to yes. begin with, and I ask, can I have a global limit? Yeah, that's that's exactly. Uh, should it be anomaly free to have a sensible global limit? Yes, exactly. It's going, mm -hmm. it's going two ways. So it's very, actually very strong condition. Is that it obvious? Uh, it's not obvious. It's based on, they, they observe this phenomenon, ADS4, so they propose for ADS4. And bit later people say that it's actually true for all the geometries mm -hmm. in the first class of solutions. And this includes gauge theory? Yeah, uh, gauge theory. I'm, I'm going to talk about the generalization of these two gauge theory later. So uh, in particular, we saw that the killer form on this first class of geometries the killer form on the hard space has to be called multiple trivial, which means the first term class with the variable weight level vanishes. And it, it is actually the same condition of anomaly free condition of super gravity. So let's go to the equations to give you a better understanding. So here, that's the sixth form anomaly of your equals one super gravity coupled to carry multiples. And here, sigma, I'm using some non conventional uh, notation. So sigma here is not a two dimensional word, it is actually four dimensional space time. And x is the target space. And L is the very weight on that model I was talking about. So suppose your gravity, super gravity, is anomaly free, then your your anomaly polynomial reduces to this form. And you can see it is actually proportional to C1 and L, the first term class of the factor weight on model. So if if and only if C1 equals zero, your theory is anomaly free. And C1 being zero is a consistency condition that we observed earlier to be able to define zero, yes. Why can't I use green shorts mechanism? Suppose it's not zero, but it factorizes. Yeah, it, because it's actually n equals one all the minimal super gravity. What, what, what kind of fields can you use to use green shorts? There, there, uh, yeah, there's no free form. Yeah, there's, there's no two more fields. But I can do like this scale. Then. Well, I, I'm not. Oh, I, you need an axiom for yeah, that. Yeah, I, I don't have that. This is very limited to n equals one all the minimal super No axioms. No, 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 nothing, okay. nothing fancy. So. Okay, so here anomaly free condition is a quantum property and C1 equals zero is a classical constraint that you impose mm -hmm. so that you can define classical quantum field theory on, on curved spaces. So this is a very nice principle, a relationship between quantum and uh, classical behaviors. Would you say that this is also restricted to the uh, situation where your target space is actually uh, smooth? Yes, of course, yes. That's kind of yeah, important, right? Yeah. That's very important, thank you. Okay, so finally here's a particular uh, explicit example. 
ADS4. Uh, you're looking at ADS4, you're going to have to take this particular uh, value of that being that like one over R thing, and their little r is the curvature radius of your ADS4. So in terms of the component fields, you can write a Lagrangian to your theory like this. And uh, again, you can see that the combination of k potential and the super potential is the only thing that's physically entering the picture. And as a consistency check, if you take your ADS4 radius to be infinity, you're supposed to get back to the consistency time. And that's the, indeed what's happening. And one peculiar property of all this, this kind of uh, series is that the curvature couplings, the highest order is 1 over r squared. This is very generic in this kind of uh, construction. And I don't have a good reason for this, but people have seen this phenomenon over and over again. And then later, we'll see that the, the, I, I did two-dimensional theory without using this procedure, but I still get one of our square terms. So it's kind of mystery to me. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, not only you get the Lagrangian, you also get a super symmetry transformation on ADS4 because you start with super gravity theory. You can just throw away the gravity part. That will give you the uh, rigid super symmetry transformation on ADS4, which depends on this uh, curvature of your space time. And you get the, you get Kenny's spin equations from the auxiliary field solutions. And I should mention that you can actually work this out from scratch, from like supersymmetry algebra on ADS4. These guys can be worked out, and these guys can be worked out too. And that's actually how they were discovered originally. And later, people realized that using this procedure, you can reproduce them from supergravity, which is really nice. So uh, as an example of the second class of solution, uh, you, you take M and bar being zero, and then you take this particular set of the uh, vector field B. And here uh, you get a geometry which looks like three sphere times uh, line. And here R is, of course, the radius of the three sphere. And here in this second class of solution, things are more familiar to us. There's no combination between Keller potential and uh, super potential, and everything behaves just like the Minkowski space time case. So uh, that's a review of what's been done by other people. And here begins what I did with my advisor. So we wanted to study gauge theory or couple to uh, curve background in this lamp uh, reasoning. So we started with n equals 1 gauge over minimal supergravity, which means that you take a minimal supergravity couple to carry multiples and gauge the uh, isometry on the target space. So here you have the uh, uh, West and Bagger Lagrangian of uh, this gauge supergravity theory. And here uh, W are the field, super field, field strengths of your gauge field. And here this term is here to uh, make sure that your, your theory is gauge invariant. And XA are holomorphic killing vectors that represents your gauge group action on your target space. And they are promoted to super field. You have a U1 R symmetric group here? You can, you can, you're allowed to have one, but I don't need one. That's you don't gauge it. You I don't have gauge it. You have it as a global symmetry. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't gauge that U1 R. You don't gauge it. Yeah. So, uh, uh, again, we can use that happening gravity procedure. And let, let me start with the first class solution. And if you do that to this uh, Lagrangian, and expand in kappa squared and throw away the gravitational coupling in terms, you're left with this Lagrangian in super space. And again, you, you see the familiar combination between kilo potential and super potential as we would expect. And uh, we want theory to be gauge invariant, of course. There is no guarantee that you, you follow the first tension cyber procedure, you'll get a gauge invariant theory. There's no guarantee of that. So you have to impose gauge invariance. So since this Combination is the only thing physically meaningful. Let's do a gauge transformation of this physical quantity, and that's what it's going to look like in terms of super fields. And here, lambda is a parameter super field that for the lowest, com lowest components is a gauge parameter. And here, f is defined as this by the, by our globally well defined combination between k and w. So let's apply this uh, gauge transformation to our Lagrangian. And this is what we have. We have a term that looks like lambda f plus lambda bar f bar times some other quantity. And remember, this curly r and this d, they have component fields m and b inside it. So 
uh, you, you're going to have to expand this thing in components and demand every component managing. And here, this curly E is what's called carrot density in Watson Becker. It's uh, basically a projection operator in several varieties, but restrict to our decoupling result, it looks like this. So these are the equations you get from demanding gauge invariants. And basically, you want all the components uh, all the components in that super field uh, equation to be zero, and that's what you have. And surprisingly, all these equations with have solution have solution if only if this single equation is true. So this is going to be our constraint. N times f is going to be zero, and the constraint derived from uh, gauge invariants. So let's look more into this, and basically. Uh, in our example that we saw earlier, this f will be something like 1 over r, with r being a, a, like a radius of your uh, uh, space time. Uh, then, because it's a constant, then this constraint is really saying that f has to be 0 everywhere on your target space. So, this is actually a pretty strong constraint, we will see later. Uh, first of all, a couple of notes. Uh, this is very, actually well defined globally because this combination is well defined globally. So f is actually well defined globally, so you can set it to zero as an equation globally on the target space. As a, on, on, on the other hand, a consistency uh, check requires everything reduced to the zero case. So suppose you take r go to infinity, so that you, your space time is going to flat, then this constraint is automatically satisfied. There is actually no constraint at all if you take r go to infinity. So that's the usual theory we have. So this is actually a nice consistency requirement. Uh, uh, I want to talk, uh, give, I want to say a word or two about the uh, gauge merits of superpotential. As I mentioned earlier, superpotential alone is not physically meaningful anymore. So if you want to talk about gauge merits, then it's not really physically meaningful. But if you want, suppose you want to do it anyway, then you, you kind of do the gauge transmission of uh, superpotential, then you follow the, 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 the uh, procedure I was, I was saying, you get this constraint. Here x prime is x times k times plus id. Here k is some other some some potential locally defined. So in order for, to for for this constraint to make sense globally, you will have to require that this k is globally well defined. And unfortunately, we do have such a k. If you recall that our killer form is actually trivial, which means that we can globally define killer potential everywhere on uh, our target space as a real function. So this is actually well defined globally, but it's not natural, you know. In principle, people would like to have killer humor. So, if you want to demand gauge invariance of W, you run into some some tip, uh, some difficulties. And uh, on the mathematical side, as I mentioned earlier, W here superpotential is, is not a function; it's a section of this I prime bundle. And uh, if you have a group action in your space, the natural question to ask is: Is, is this action can be lifted to? Uh, uh, action on the bundle. So suppose you have a lift, then uh, the lift is going to look like this, where G is an element of your gauge group, X is a point on your target space, and A is an element in the torsor. And lambda and mu are some quantities that define the lifting. So suppose you want to you want to lift into uh, you want to lift to this particular rough one F and bundle. Then these are the the quantities you get. And uh, apparently, if you want to to be consistent everywhere, the only way it's going to happen is for f prime to be zero, meaning mu g to be zero, so that you can have you can have a uh, every well defined lifting of your gauge group action to this f prime space. So this is a mathematical way of seeing the constraint I derived earlier. So let's let's see what what are the consequences of this constraining equation. So uh, this d a is the auxiliary field inside the vector multiplet in the super gravity here in the in the super symmetry theory, uh, and uh, it's given by a, a differential equation. So you can integrate over the differential equation, you get a solution. And here c is an integrational constant, and k prime can be any killer potential you want. You, you do a killer transformation, the d is stays invariant. So. Uh, and physically, we know that this constant, the integration of constant C, is what's called a elastic parameter. And uh, fixing F to be zero, which is given by this, is actually fixing that integration of constant to be zero, which means your theory has to have a vanishing F by parameter, which is very interesting because uh, 
uh, you can compare it to, uh, uh, let me talk about it later. So uh, on the mathematical side, uh, gauge theory, in gauge theory, your, your modular space cannot be a quotient of your target space at gauge loop action. So the quotient, you want to have some sort of constraint on the quotient. And we, we saw earlier that the cater formula on a target space is cohomotic and trivial. And because of the constraining equation setting d equals zero, you have you see that after the same planet quotient, you have a, you also have a, a cohomotic trivial cater form on the quotient, which descends from the cohomotic trivial cater form on the target space. So mathematically, this is well, this is nice and consistent. And uh, uh, let's go to background principle. So. Uh, I talk about background principle in the on gauge case. So here we have a gauge theory. We will see that this constraint f is zero, f equals zero is going to be a consequence of the background principle that we saw earlier. And basically, what I mean is that if you want a uh, anomaly-free supergravity theory coupled to gauge theory, then uh, the anomaly-free condition is going, to be, is, is going to be the same as if you want to deform this theory to some some other uh, curved background. So, a bit of uh, in terms of the formulas, here is the uh, uh, anomaly uh, sixth form of your theory, gra super gravity coupled to gauge theory, if your sigma model is actually anomaly free. So, then let me let me just define a bunch of quantities before I move on. So here, uh, because I have a gauge theory, I I will need a principal bundle. I'm going to call it P, and then I'm going to define this curly M as a quotient of P times X. Which is basically what uh, physical chiral superfield phi lives on. So my phi is going to be the section of this bundle. It's an associated bundle associated to P and X. So my curly L bundle is going to be related to the Berger Witten Lamb bundle in, in the following way that uh, I have an equivalent structure on P cross X, of course, then the equivalent structure descends to this quotient. And curly M, then you can of course lift the uh, Berger-Witten Lamb bundle to this curly M, and then cushion it again by G because of the equivalent structure. That way you define a new Lamb bundle called L. Why are we doing this? Because this new Lamb bundle L actually uh, has two information inside it. One information is the killer form that we saw earlier. The other information is actually the I phi parameter, which which is from the equivalent structure. So uh, if if your supergravity is not free, then C1 of L has to be zero, which means that uh, your uh, cater form has to be trivial, just as the, the previous cases. Also, your equivalent structure has to be trivial on this trivial line bundle, which is saying that F I parameter is zero. So this, free, this consequence of F I parameter being zero is actually uh, derived from background principle, so I'm, I'm, I think background principle is something that that's, that's true, although I don't have a proof of it. So let's see an example. So in components, you can you can get EX4 as we did before, and this is what the Lagrangian looks like. And uh, similarly, you have a combination between killer potential and super potential, and you have a bunch of uh, covariant derivatives, you have curvature coupling terms, and uh, uh, one, one phenomenon I should mention that here, the Gagino here is not a couple to anything. It's just a Gagino. It's not a section of any bundle. So the lift of the gauge progression to Gagino is trivial. You just do the usual uh, gauge progression on the, on the Gagino being a fermion, which is in contrast to the supergravity case. In supergravity, O the minimal equals one supergravity in four dimensions. Becker and Witten observed that because your Gagino is actually a section of this Becker Witten line bundle, you 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 have to lift your group action to this line bundle, and uh, these guys Cyberg and then Distler and Sharp and then Hallam and Sharp they observed that this existence of such a lifting will require your FI parameter to be quantized, which means your FI parameter has to be some integer times some fixed quantity. What parameters are there? Uh, fairly fair large surprise. Oh, fair, 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 yeah, fair. Fair. Yeah. So that in that in that simple gravity case, we saw that F I frame has actually quantized, it has this discrete spectrum. But here in our case, since we decouple gravity, we are expecting something different. And again, uh, we, saw, we indeed we see that in our case, F I frame has to be zero. It has to be fixed as zero. 
So this is different from silver writing. Uh, but the, the common uh, thing between these two phenomena is that they are, they are both consequences of lifting uh, your gauge regression to some non-trivial structure. And then another example of the second class of solution. So if you take S3 cross R example, then your superspace Lagrangian will look like this. And again, there is no combination between K and W in the second class of solution, and you do everything like the usual way. You demand the super potential W to be gauge invariant. You do transmission on carrier potential. The result is going to be the same as the uh, usual Minkowski A equals one super symmetric theory. Okay, that's the end of part one. Any questions? Okay, let's move on to the second part, which is about a particular fixed background two sphere. Uh, it's going to be A equals two comma two, not a single one on two sphere. So, a bit of motivation. Uh, recently, there has been a lot of works done on uh, series on two sphere. Uh, in particular, two comma two JSM. Uh, on two sphere, the partition function of this series were computed by these two groups of people simultaneously, and the uh, result surprisingly led to many new developments in, in many different lines. So, for example, uh, Jokers, Kumar, Pan Morris, and Romo they used these results to compute the gram weighting invariants of collabial manifolds, which is a surprise because people didn't know how to compute a lot of the uh, gram weighting invariants of a lot of collabials before. Now, with the aid of this uh, partition function of GSM on two sphere, people were able to compute a lot of uh, stuff that it couldn't do before. And uh, then there are some work on computation of cyber, uh, cyber weight and carrier potential uh, using the idea of geometric construction or geometric uh, engineering from string theory, a uh, 4D gauge series. And then there are a lot of other. Uh, new developments I'm not listing here. For example, people uh, have used this, just recently people have used the partition function to compute the perturbative part of uh, the correction to uh, the Calabial uh, metric on the on the Keller multiply space of Calabial manifold. So my 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 motivation was to actually work out the non-insert model cases. Instead of a GLSM uh, looking for a non insert model with a GLSM completion, I would like to start directly with a non thing model on two sphere. And in principle, you can definitely follow frustration cyber general procedure, final gravity theory, and decouple gravity, and get what you get. The, the trouble is that you're going to have to pick a gravity theory, super gravity. And then you're going to have to have a consistent way of decoupling gravity in two dimensions, which is different from four dimensional cases. And uh, I was able to do that for GLSM. You can actually uh, uh, derive the 2-2 JLSM on two sphere, those guys, uh, who, who, uh, which was discussed by uh, the, the other guys, uh, by decoupling gravity from 2D equals 1 comma 1 super gravity coupled to 2 comma 2 parabolic. So it's kind of weird. And so uh, to actually derive non instant models, I, I haven't found a super gravity theory to start with, so I decided to start from scratch. And we actually worked it out from first principles and algebra and supersymmetry. So, first of all, since we are having a non-trivial non global topology on our space two-dimensional worksheet, which is S2, we will have a global supersymmetry algebra in contrast to the local super algebra that people usually use on R2. And this global super algebra is given by OSP2 slash 2, which is as morphic to SU2 slash 1. And if you look into it, it has a bosonic algebra, sub-algebra, which is SU2 times U1. And here, SU2 is naturally interpreted as the isometry on the two-sphere, of course. But this U1R is actually very uh, interesting because it's actually an R-symmetry. It's a vector-like R-symmetry, which is actually inside the associated algebra instead of being an automorphism of the algebra, which is very different from the uh, usual rigid supersymmetry algebra on R2. As a, as a consequence, your whatever your quantum field theory is, if your theory is going to have this symmetry, you're going to have to respect this U1R. And the way to do that on a non instant model is actually to have a killing vector on your target space representing the uh, U1R action on your bosonic fields, which uh, parameterize your target space M. So here X is going to be the holomorphic killing vector corresponding to this U1R. And this is uh, our result. We worked out this Lagrangian term by term, and uh, 
when we get a property that the highest order curvature term is one of r squared, again, similar to the general construction. And uh, here we see that uh, the killer potential actually enters our Lagrangian explicitly. And also, uh, uh, we have this weird combination, a uh, two formula and the uh, covariant derivative of the holomorphic k, 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 k vector on the target space. And as a nice consistency check, if you take the radius to be infinity, you recover the usual sigma model on R2. So these are the supersymmetry uh, transformations that we worked out. And again, you have these curvature dependent terms in that. Um, and these are well known Kenny spinner equation on two sphere. And that's actually one of the starting points of our construction. We want our theory to respect these Kenny spinner equations. And also, the solution to these equations are known mathematically, so you can use them to do localization as you want. And uh, uh, I, I, we, we have two constraints on the theory we just constructed. First, since we have a, a non-trivial global symmetry U1R on the part of this, your killer potential ha has to respect this uh, 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 symmetry, so the lead derivative of K has to be zero. And on, over quadrant patches, it's going to be uh, consistent so that this equation has to be satisfied. And uh, I was told by a mathematician that for any Kerner manifold uh, with a holomorphic isometry x, uh, for data on a good open cover, this can always be satisfied. So mathematically, we are fine. And uh, the second condition says that your super potential has to be homogeneous to degree 2 with respect to this. Uh, uh, back to like you want R symmetry, meaning this following equation is satisfied. And you, in particular, if you if you choose a everywhere vanishing homomorphic Kenny vector X, you cannot have any superpotential, which is very different from the usual uh, R2 test that you can have any superpotential you want. And other than these two natural constraints, there's no further constraint on the target phase geometry, which is very different from the 40 case. We, we saw a lot of constraints from the 40. Uh, construction before, but here it's very simple and natural. And uh, uh, here for complete for completeness, I also included the uh, explicit form of the U1R transformation on the target phase. And uh, surprisingly, there is no curvature dependent terms in this transformations. And uh, as a consequence, I think in general a global symmetry on uh, non exam model should act on their target space non trivially via some isometry. And as such, I believe that this U1R transformation I'm running down and is actually true for any two-dimensional non-infinite model, whatever your worship is, be it any remote surface or any two-dimensional manifold you want. This, this, this transformation will be true as long as your theory has a U1R vector-like symmetry. A, a particular example is our S2 case. Another particular example is R2 case, the usual one we, we, we uh, are familiar with. So aside from working out the uh, 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 Kairos superfield, we also work out the Lagrangian for the twisted Kairos because in 2D we know that there is there is a, a, a quantity called twisted Kairos multiplet, and this is the Lagrangian of the twisted Kairos multiplet. And in particular, there is no killer potential inside this Lagrangian, but for the twisted Kairos potential, super potential, we have a curvature dependency right here. So this is actually very different from the usual. Uh, to the cover uh, Lagrangian on R2 because its curvature dependent terms will break a lot of symmetries. And as a consistency check, this Lagrangian reduced to the usual one on R2 if R goes in the So these are the super symmetry transformation, and again, uh, you have curvature dependent terms everywhere. And here, Y is analogous to X we saw before, is a, is a, a holomorphic vector on the target space of the so two the, the difference really then is uh, the action of the U1R. Exactly. On the Naturally, you would think that a vector like U1R on Carol will be like a twisted uh, axiom like uh, uh, U1R on, on the twisted Carol. And that's exactly what's going on here. And what I'm not showing you is that I, I'm actually changing the algebra, so the algebra. If you want to go to twisted Carol from Carol, you have to change the global supersymmetry algebra to do that. That's why. We're having a different action and different color. In what way? How do you change this process? Oh, be because, because you can define a different SUSI algebra on two here. And one is for uh, one is for uh, carbon multiplet, the other one is for twisted carbon multiplet. My question is what is exactly the nature of the change uh, for the twisted case? It's a, 
what does it become? Previously, you had SU yeah. two slash one. It's isomorphism. It still has you slash two slash one. It's just an auto auto isomorphism. That you, you change a bunch of gallery of uh, some signs involved. Well, if you change signs, it's the, the, the same algebra. Anymore. It's the same algebra, but but different different realizing. It's an automorphism from one algebra to itself. For example, mm -hmm. you have algebra, then you have an isomorphism from it, it back to itself. It doesn't mean that you have the same thing again. You can map non trivially between elements. That's exactly what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Although formally you have the same algebra, but you, you kind of change things a bit. And the way to see that is actually you start with two two super conformal algebra in two dimensions. And then you kind of free the conformal part. There are two ways of freezing that. And these two freezing give you two SU2 slash one, which are isomorphic to each other, which realize two, uh, two uh, different kind of multiples. So a quick observation is that because of this explicit one of our times W dependence, we see that the usual uh, symmetry between Kara and Tracy Kara is broken here on two sphere. In the usual case, we, we can do a simple twist and obtain a Lagrangian for the twist character from the Kairos. Here you cannot do that because this one of our dependent terms inside the Kairos, uh, twisted Kairos Lagrangian. And uh, this is one of the differences between this R S2 stories and R2 stories. Another one observation that I've been made is, that, uh, is about topological twist. Uh, in a special case where you have no super potential and also your holomorphic killing vector is actually zero everywhere, you just choose that, then you can do a topological twist like A and B twist because there's no curvature coupling, everything fine. But in a generic case, you will have a non trivial X, you will have a non trivial W. The story is going to be very much more complicated because the uh, curvature coupling is inside a Lagrangian. So, on a fundamental way, a fundamental level, uh, the, uh, the problem is that. Uh, uh, the curvature terms, they will, they will survive after the twist and they will break your BRSC symmetry so that your action will not be BRSC closed. So whatever you do to your theory, if you twist it, you get a, a theory that is not topological. So this is a, and, and first time mysterious, but it's actually not. Because I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that topological field theory do not exist on two sphere because I, they do. A and B model, B model and B model, they're there. and. Uh, what I'm saying is that they are not obtained by twisting from a theory coupled to curvature. They are obtained by twisting of a theory coupled to no curvature, like the usual non instant model. But if you, if you couple your theory to, your, to curvature in a space time, then you cannot obtain a topological theory series by doing naive topological twists. So I'm running out of time, so here's a brief summary of what I said. We saw that we con we can construct four-dimensional equals one super symmetric A three on four four manifolds. We saw constraints on target space. We saw constraints on um, uh, uh, space time, and uh, uh, we we also discussed this thing called background principle, which is a relation between classical and quantum phenomena. And we also constructed two comma two non instant model on two sphere, and we saw some uh, uh, different properties of this series uh, and some new uh, insights. And uh, the uh, there are a lot of stuff to be done further. For example, in four dimensions, in principle, you should be able to do uh, instant counting and super symmetric localization. So these two, two things should be related. So that's in principle, but in practice, it's kind of hard and something I've been thinking of, but I, I haven't been able to do so. And so, of course, you can do a lot of other quantum analysis of the 40 gauge theory you constructed. Uh, one thing I, I did is that I, the, there, I, the observation I made is that there can be no non-trivial gauging sounds on AS4. That's one of the observations I did made along the lines. Uh, another, way, another way of following up this uh, work is that uh, we can actually compute the partition function of the 2,2 2, non a sigma model on 2 sphere, which is something I'm currently doing and I get some partial results, which involves this quantity called gamma genus or gamma class uh, of your target space. Uh, and I, I'm in the middle of interpreting what I have mathematically and physically, so I cannot report anything specific here. But this is definitely interesting because we know that GSM partition function can give us so many information about geometry and physics. I'm hoping that this direct computation of the non instant model partition function will give us more. But I'm, I'm just hoping. And thank you. Thank you.
So, questions from Brian? The quick one? Yeah. Uh, what is your widget algebra in 4D? The symmetry algebra. Oh, it's just a Euro M with one. For, for is it concurrent still? Yeah, concurrent. I, I, it's I, not deformed? No, it's the, not uh, deformed. B and M? Or no, no, like it's just the simplest one. Mm -hmm. The one in better, the Western better. But in 2D, you added the generator U1R in the end content of QEQ. Exactly. But it didn't have to be there. In the super concrete, you don't have such generators, right? Uh, actually, it's more like ADS type algebra you have. No, no. In this case, I have a two sphere, so there's no concrete. There's no Lorentzian signature line. It's a Euclidean theory. And this is a Euclidean well, super signature Same thing in 4D. I could have four sphere. Yeah, I didn't talk about actually four sphere. There's a, there, there are, I actually constructed four sphere Lagrangian in my paper. I didn't talk about it because the, the theory again is not real. The Lagrangian is actually imaginary. Which means that if there is something that, that's Lorentzian, then it's, the theory is not unitary. So it's kind of a mystery. I, I don't fully, un fully understand it, so I kind of uh, didn't want to talk about it. But on the two, two theory side, it, 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 everything is fine. Your theory is fine. And again, this is a global super symmetry. I don't have the local one that we use in R2. Anything else? All right, if not, let's thank Brian. Thank you.